crowded out of our celebration. And I do want to talk about that this morning, just to remind you. I want us to start reading in 1 Corinthians eleven twenty four and 25. <clears throat> and when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, Take, eat, this is my body, which is broken for you. This do in remembrance of me. In the same manner also he took the cup when he had supped, saying, This cup is the New Testament, the new promise in my blood. This do ye as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. Let's join one another in prayer here. Lord Jesus Christ, we just so much pray, Lord, for your spirit to reign in our hearts and in our church and in these homes, asking you, dear Lord, for your presence to be felt here in this very, very holy, holy of days. Asking you, Lord, to open our hearts, the doors and windows of our heart, that we would hear your word as it is spoken, and that, Lord, we will we will change the things in our lives that need to be changed to keep you first. In Jesus' name, amen. Do this in remembrance of me, he said. I change it to do Christmas in remembrance of me. My wife gave me a gift yesterday. Was it yesterday or Friday? And she gave me $100. And she turned me loose in the sportsman's warehouse. I was so excited. I was so pumped. First, I don't think she's ever done that. That was my Christmas gift. And the trouble is, I guess because she's done that so often, I couldn't find anything I needed. That's embarrassing to admit. I bought a coffee mug but I always buy coffee mugs. And uh, I, have a, I have a tendency to want to take coffee in a mug with me wherever I go. And uh, it was just an, uh, it was an amazing thing to me, for me, to go into Sportsman's Warehouse and not be able to find anything that I need. Now, of course, there's a difference between needs and wants. About every other shelf, I found things I wanted, but then, even though she, she dropped me off and didn't come with me, she came with me. Is this a need or a want? Forty-seven years she has said that to me. And generally, I'm glad she's not up here on the stage to correct me. But we have to be so careful. I, I'm in a stage of life, I suppose, where everything I've ever needed, I have. And in some cases, doubles in case I lose the first one. But it's so important to us to be careful of those three traps of Christmas. Remembering what it was, what Christmas was and is. God saw a need on earth. Mankind was sinning. Big time. And the penalty for sin is death, to go to hell. Adam and Eve's original sin was passed down through every birth to every man. Someone had to pay for that sin debt, the original sin of Adam. And Jesus came down in the form of a baby, grew, taught, died for our sins, gave us, gave us the blueprint for life, how to live. I don't believe there's anything of any importance that aren't covered in here. He tells us how to live. So I appreciate that so much about, about this. Do this in remembrance of me or do Christmas in remembrance of me. Being where, beware of the three traps of Christmas. The first one is, is mythalizing Christmas. Over, 
overemphasizing all the mythology of Christmas. These are intended to crowd out Christmas, the Christ child. Now, I know there are some here and maybe even at home that, that don't, don't think you should teach Santa Claus, elves, flying reindeer, those things, to your families. Bonnie and I are kind of balanced in that. We do. We do have Santa, uh, did have Santa in our home growing up. And uh, even though, even though uh, we had the Santa Claus, we had the Santa Claus uh, thing where it's just fun. And I think it might be just fun for us as well. But I remember my, my daughter, I don't know at what age, eight or nine, telling us she knew. She knew. That, and she said, you, you, I know, I learned it at school. I, I know the truth about Santa Claus. And I said, well, that's a shame because even your mom and I believe, have a belief in, in Santa Claus in which, in which he gives gifts to those in need. And uh, as I left her bedroom on Christmas Eve, she said, I just want you to know, Dad, I understand. Well, she understood. And I went out into my bedroom. I had a window right on the roof of the porch, so I pulled up my window. I don't know what gets into me. And I went out on the window and I walked around this wraparound porch roof to her window. And I jingled bells, which I'd taken with me. And I stomped on the, on the roof. I went back in my window, went into her, her bedroom, and she's under the blankets saying, I believe, I believe, I believe, I believe. What worked for Angie's going to work for Jamie, right? I go back into Jamie's room, and he says, Dad, I, I've got to go to bed now. Santa's coming. And I said, okay, okay, we'll let you go. We'll let you go. So I pray with him, go into my room, get on the porch, go around to his window, stomp with the jingle bells, go back into my room, go out, go into his room, and he's not there. He's not there until I saw a tiny flicker of the blankets. He was in a tiny little ball on the bottom of his bed with the blankets over him. And I said, Jamie, what's wrong? He said, and he doesn't do this very often, shut up, Dad, I'm asleep. It's just fun. It, it was just fun. But you got to stay balanced. And I know some of you don't believe in that, and that's good for you and for your, your core beliefs. But if, if you can keep Jesus first in this, you have to be so careful. Having Santa Claus and all those things, they're intended to crowd out the Christ child. If you're not careful, everything becomes Santa. And you and I forget about about celebrating Jesus. The, the, the second trap of Christmas is secularizing Christmas. Celebrating Christmas without the Christ child. And, and I, I see that, I know I've admitted it and I've taken a lot of grief for it, but I like to watch the Hallmark Christmas shows. I don't know why they put a smile on my face and she makes fun of me for it. Oh yeah, Rodney's in the back in the back media room saying he makes fun of me for it. But uh, there's there it's to me it's just sweet, it's kind, there's no no immorality mentioned in all of those, but they hardly ever mention mention the Christ child, the Lord Jesus Christ. They hardly ever do that. And we need we, we have to celebrate Christmas with the Christ child. Yes, the even just now, I made the comment this morning when I came over to unlock. 
went back in the, in the house and Bonnie says, well, how's the weather? And I said, it belongs on a Christmas card. So beautiful out there. I'm just grateful for Corey and all those others who have helped keep the snow off the walks for us. Uh, Mike came and he worked really hard this week with a snowblower for us and others. Uh, and I just appreciate you. But remember, we need to make sure we keep Jesus Christ in our Christmas, secularizing Christmas. The third trap is similar, commercializing and materializing of Christmas. Being overly materialistic with the things, the gifts, all the products, all these have the intent of crowding out the Christ child. I know several years back I played a little game with you. This is just a part of it. I don't know why they're pushing all this jewelry on TV right now. I guess trying to convince others for them to do, to do some uh, one knee asking. But well, here's what you get. He went to Jared, oh man, he's going to answer these questions. Here's one of my favorites. Every kiss begins with K. Uh, the Toyota has one that touches me. That, that pretty girl in the Toyota commercials, uh, she's standing there and she looks right into the camera and she said, Toyotas, Toyotas are the new mistletoe. I like that. Toyota is the new mistletoe. Be careful. Be careful doing all these things we do at Christmas and, and crowding out the true reason for the season, crowding out Jesus Christ. I have a gift under the, under the tree right now. Uh, I might as well tell you, Christy wrapped it. That's why it's so nice. Oh. But uh, I'm, it's, it's Christmas, and I find it's right there in front of the Christmas tree, and I am, I'm very excited to see her face when she opens up her, this last $5,000 gift that I bought her. There's a, there's a spirit in us. We love, we loved to give gifts as, as well as receive gifts. So uh, when, I, when I say this, I have some suggestions. This worked in our family. From the youngest of years, my daughter Angie, who's, I won't say how old she is, Bonnie's shaking her head no, my, the, my, my little girl back in the 70s, can I say it that way? Okay. My little girl back in the 70s, we taught her with these little mud people the nativity scene. And we taught her to act it out using voices of the shepherds and the wise men and Mary and Joseph and the baby. At a very young age, on Christmas morning... We did the nativity scene that way for both our children. Little Angie would t pick up the baby Jesus and kiss it every year. So touching. Just a suggestion. Have a nativity scene. And if your kids won't act it out, you act it out. But keeping that first and foremost. Having birthday cake. Bonnie always had a birthday cake with candles. And we would sing... We would sing happy birthday to Jesus and then blow out the candles together. Suggestions to keep Jesus in your Christmas. Giving gifts as a family to the misfortunate. We've had a few this year, some that are listening right now, I assume. Some that will be here in the second service. But COVID has not been kind. 
And there are some of us who are more in need than ever. And there are some of us that have given gifts to the misfortunate. And the church as a whole has given out help to the misfortunate. Special, special feeling when you give gifts to the misfortunate. Prayer, Bible reading, reading the first Christmas story together, keeping Jesus as the focal point. I'm not saying there's anything wrong with Santa. I'm not saying there's anything wrong with gifts. It's only wrong when that is the focus. And being able to have balance and keeping Jesus first is so important. Things to remember, Jesus always was. I keep pointing to my, my right, your left here, but we have a, a baby doll in a manger down front here. The children will be using, I assume, for our children's program. But uh, we, we need to remember that that's not how Jesus started. He helped. In creation, Genesis 1.1. And he always was. There is the doctrine and teaching of the, pre, the pre-existent Christ. He always has been in the form of the Trinity. And he always will be. The baby is what he chose to come to earth as. There's so many great reasons for him to have done that. But uh, coming to earth as a baby, he didn't inherit. He didn't inherit any of Adam's sin. He was pure. Our children, our children inherit Adam's sin and they need to receive Christ to have that sin penalty paid for. But thanks to remember, Jesus always was. Jesus always will be. And he's not a baby anymore. Reminding your family as you're doing the nativity scene that Jesus always will be. He always was. It's kind of a good time for you to be able to teach your family or remind your family that he's coming back. Not in the form of a baby. He's coming back in the form of a general. He's coming back in the form of a king of kings where he's going to, he's going to lead an army against the Antichrist, the globalist of the time, who are going to try to attack and annihilate Israel. He's coming back at Armageddon riding a white horse with a flaming sword coming out of his mouth. He's coming back. And we will spend the vast, 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 vast majority of our life in heaven with him. It's a great time for you to remember that and remind others. He's the reason we get to go to heaven. We've had some death lately. And in those funeral services, I constantly remind them he's the reason we'll get to see our family again. He's the reason. I wanted you to keep Christ in your Christmas and remember He's the reason for the season. So let's dedicate this communion in remembrance of Jesus Christ's birthday. At home, I hope you have some some sort of cracker at home, I hope you have some sort of juice. It's not, it's not in the host. It's not in this. It's in the symbolism of it and what you make with it. I do warn you, if you're here in the church service, be, to be careful. Uh, this little cup is in two parts, and they're separated. And when you open up the top, you get the wafer. We'll do that first. And then I'll instruct you to open up the second part, which will be the juice, which is representing the blood of Christ. So let's do that now.
1 Corinthians 11. Before we begin, here in the sanctuary and at home, let's have a time at home even too of silent prayer where we confess our sins, we clean our hearts so that we can have communion. Let's do that now. Lord, we ask your forgiveness for our sins. You who have the power to remember, we ask you to forgive us and forget. Forget our sins, Lord, we pray. That, Lord, we might have this communion with you. I point out, Lord, that you are always so quick to forgive. May we have that as well. In Christ's name, amen. 1 Corinthians eleven twenty three. For I have received of the Lord, the Apostle Paul speaking, that which also I deliver to you. The Lord Jesus, the same night in which he was betrayed, he took the bread, here in the church, if you'll take the top layer off, if you haven't done that already. Of all things, mine's not coming off. Verse 24, And when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, Take, eat. This is my body, which is broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Eat. Lord, as this wafer, this cracker, is to remind us of your broken body, you, the most powerful person in the universe, allowed, allowed mankind to hurt you, whip you, and then to nail you to a tree, asking you, Lord Jesus, to help us now to remember what you did for us. This broken cracker, this wafer, thank you, Lord. We seek communion with you as we remember what you did for us. In Jesus' name, amen. The scripture goes on. Verse 25, After the same manner also he took the cup when he had supped, saying, This cup is the New Testament in my blood. This do ye as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. Being careful what we'll spill. Take the cup. Lord Jesus Christ, it was your blood. There is no forgiveness. There is no remission of sin without your shed blood. Oh God... We as sinners, saved by grace, we as sinners are so grateful that you would shed your blood for us. That you would shed your blood to wash away our sins. We thank you, Lord, from the bottom of our heart. In Jesus' name, amen. Verse 26, For as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you do show the Lord's death 
till he come. This scripture was written years after Jesus was crucified, buried, and rose again. The Apostle Paul was reminding us he is coming back. And that is our saving grace, our saving, our, our saving thought for the, the, even this Christmas. Every season could be our last, our last, because it's a promise he's coming back. If we were to have skipped ahead to verse 27, 1 Corinthians eleven twenty-seven. Wherefore, whosoever shall eat this bread and drink this cup unworthily shall be guilty of the body and the blood of the Lord. As if you, as if you had crucified Christ yourself. So in verse 28, it says this, Let a man examine himself and let him eat that bread and drink that cup. Lord Jesus Christ, we seek a closer walk with Thee. We seek, Lord, a better, closer relationship with You. With our hearts now cleansed and our hearts now pulled, to get, pulled toward You. Pulled toward You in communion with You and with each other. Lord, we seek, we seek a better life and a closer relationship with you. Let that be the result of today, both here in the sanctuary and at home. Lord, that we would, as we get up, that we would seek a better, closer, purer relationship with you. In Jesus' name, amen. We're about to sing a...